Well, good morning and welcome to Darlington Baptist Church Online. My name's Vicky and I'm one of the ministers here at the church. I'd like to just say a special welcome this morning. If you are online and visiting us for the very first time, you are really welcome. If you're interested to find out more about the church and what we do as a church community, you'll be really welcome to get in touch with us. You can do so through several ways. You can get in touch with us through our Facebook page. You can get in touch with us through our website or through our email, which is ministers at darlingtonbaptist.org. We would really love to hear from you and have the opportunity to share more of the heart of God for Darlington Baptist Church. Just before we begin our worship time this morning, just a few things to remind you about. Currently as a church, we're praying together through the 40 days of Lent at 9pm each evening on Facebook and YouTube. If you haven't yet joined in with that, you'll be really welcome to, and we'd love for you to join in with us. That's just 10 minutes, 9pm each evening throughout Lent. Our annual church meeting is at 7pm on Thursday the 25th of March on Zoom. If you're a member of the church, you should have already received a link for that meeting. If you haven't yet received a meeting, uh, a link for the meeting and want one, could you please just get in touch with us and let us know. On Sunday the 28th, uh, we have our online prayer meeting at 6pm and that's a Zoom prayer meeting. So again, if you want that link and haven't got it, please do get in touch with us. Especially members, if you could make a special effort, if you're a regular member of Darlington Baptist Church, to really try and join that prayer meeting as we seek God together for his heart and his wisdom for the church and for the direction and its future. So it'd be great, uh, particularly members, but anybody's welcome to join us there. We are excited to be meeting back together again as a church. It's been a, a long time and we're excited to be able to start to meet people in person again. So our services will be reopening over Easter. We will be open on Good Friday to have a Good Friday service. If you haven't yet booked in, please do so. And Easter Sunday will be open again at 10.30 on Sunday morning and 6pm on Sunday evening over in Corporation Road. So if you haven't yet booked in for one of those services, please do let us know. Want to remind you as well over the Easter time, the Church is Together or One Voice Darlington is promoting the Hope Is Here initiative. And we're seeking through social media to reach out to the community of Darlington with our stories of hope in Jesus. And a, a little bit about more about that will be coming up um, throughout the service. Now here at the church, we love to celebrate birthdays and this week we want to celebrate George Coulter's birthday. So I'm going to say a huge happy birthday to you, George. Sorry we can't see you in person and sing to you, but, but we're really wishing you a happy birthday. And what we like to do here at the church is just pray for people whose birthdays it is so that they have an opportunity to be prayed for by the whole fellowship at least once a year. So would you join me just now in lifting up George and just giving our time of worship together to God. Father God, we thank you for George today. Lord God, we thank you that you know him, that you love him. We thank you, Lord God, for the years that he has walked with you and known you. Lord God, we thank you that this day you place your hand upon him afresh. Father God, we thank you that, that you love him and have called him. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that is poured out upon George's life. And Father God, we pray that during his birthday week, Lord, let him have a good week. Let him be blessed. Lord God, let him know your presence. Father God, we thank you for the days ahead and into George's future and the, the path that you have already made for him. And Father God, we pray that in the days ahead, George would know Jesus more closely than he has in the years that have gone by. Lord God, may he find a, a new intimacy with Jesus. So Lord, bless George on this birthday and in this year to come. Just bless him and his family, we pray in Jesus' name. And God, we just give you our time of worship just now as we sing together, as we search your word together, as we pray together. Father God, we give you this time and we pray that your will would be done amongst us, that your kingdom would come and that Jesus would be high and lifted up amongst us this morning. So Lord, take our time now. Take this, this worship, Lord God, as our offering to you and may Jesus be made known amongst us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like me his praise should sing. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise the everlasting King. Praise Him for His grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise Him still the same forever. Slow to chide and swift to bless. Is here. Hope is here. Hope is here. Hope is here. Right now, our world is in need of hope. This last year has been really tough, and for many people, hope has been elusive. We've encountered job losses, business closures, we have seen higher rates of suicide, mental health concerns, and self harm. We have experienced cancelled hospital appointments. We have seen loneliness and isolation, higher use of food banks and families on their knees financially. We have experienced an increase in drug and alcohol use and abuse as people seek to numb the pain of their circumstances. And of course, we've all experienced grief and sorrow and loss. In just a few weeks time, it's Easter and Easter is our great celebration of hope. It is the story of light over darkness. It is the story of forgiveness and love over hatred. And it is the story of life coming out of death. Every year on social media, I write something about Easter on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I'm never entirely convinced what relevance the things that I write have to the lives of my contacts and friends who don't yet know Jesus. And I've been wondering, is there a way that I can share the hope of Jesus in a more real and more tangible way for those who don't yet know him? You see, we all have a story of hope. I 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 have a story of hope. 
So we are asking you as One Voice Darlington, would you join us this Easter in flooding our social media with the message, hope is here. We can do that in three ways. Join us by changing your profile picture to the hope is here picture. Join us by sharing the One Voice Darlington video stories of hope over the Easter weekend. Join us by sharing your own 30 second story of hope and sharing it on social media. We all have a story to share. What is your story of hope? Join us this Easter. We're going to take time just now to pray together, to seek God for his world, for our nation, for Darlington and for our church family. So would you just pray with me this morning? Father God, we come this morning and we begin by recognising who you are. Lord God, we thank you that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord God, we thank you this morning that you are love, that you are kindness, that you are goodness, that you are faithfulness, that you are all things that are good in our lives. Father God, we thank you for who you are this morning. We thank you that you are the Lion of Judah and you are the Lamb that was slain. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are God, our provider, that you are God, our peace, that you are God, our shield, that Father God, you are God, our creator. Lord, you are the God that goes ahead of us. Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are and we find ourselves in you this morning. Lord God, we recognize today there is no better and no safer place to be than in the very presence and the will of God Almighty. And so, Lord God, we recognize this morning that we come to the one who is more than able. We come to the one who provides breath for us each day. We come to the one who created our very beings, that we come to the one this morning who spoke and the world burst into existence and life flowed forth. You are the life-giving God and Father God we come to you this morning because we know that there is no better place, there is no safer place and you are able. And so Father we come to you today and we bring our world. Lord we lift up the places in this world that are in pain, the places in this world that are suffering Pray particularly today, Lord God, for Myanmar. Lord, we lift that country to you, that nation, and we pray, Father God, would you intervene? Lord God, would you break the violence that is happening in that place? Would you break, Father God, all that is wrong that is happening in Myanmar? Father God, would you come and would you break it and would you bring about peace in that place? Lord, we pray today for Yemen. Lord God, we pray for the, the terrible things taking place in Yemen. We lift that nation to you. And Father God, we pray that you would break that hold over Yemen. And Father God, we pray that there would come in that country and um, peace. And we pray that there would come in that country a, a greater level of prosperity and a greater level of equality. Lord, have your way in those nations, we pray. We pray today, Father God, for Atlanta and the shootings that took place this week. Lord God, would you come, Father God, and bring justice to that place. Lord, bring justice in the midst of that cause in Jesus' name. We pray for the families that are left grieving. Father God, would you comfort them? And Lord, out of a terrible, terrible situation, would you bring some good, we pray. Lord, we pray today for Europe. Um, and, and the, our close neighbours as they consider uh, the need for a third lockdown and the, the increase in the spread of coronavirus in that, those, those close nations. Lord, we pray, would you give strategies to those leaders, 
Father God, we pray that, that, that the disease would abate. Father God, we pray today that you'll pr bring protection and you'll bring comfort. And Father God, we pray that that disease would begin to be eradicated in that nation or in those nations. So Lord, for Europe today, Lord, we pray today for the UK too. We lift up the United Kingdom to you. Lord, we pray for our government. We pray for our prime minister. We pray for his cabinet. Father God, we pray for the UK economy. Lord, we pray for our healthcare system today. Lord God, we pray for those across our nation that are feeling hopeless, that are feeling lost. Lord, for those that are grieving, for those that are suffering. Lord God, so many issues. For those that are hungry, so many issues across our nation. And Lord, we pray that you would cause your church post-coronavirus to rise up in new ways and that Jesus and the hope of Jesus would be proclaimed, that we would be the very hands and feet of Jesus to this nation. Lord, have your way, we pray. Lord, we pray too today for Darlington. Bless our town, Father God. We thank you for all that you have done here. Lord, we thank you for the treasury coming. We thank you for the prospect of new jobs. Lord God, we thank you for all that is taking place in this town. And Lord God, we pray that you would continue to cause all of those things to be successful in Jesus' name. But Lord, we pray that in the midst of any success that takes place for the most vulnerable, the most isolated, Lord, the most broken amongst our society, may they not be left behind. But help us, Father God, to create a more equitable society, a more equitable town. And Father God, may that prosperity that we see in the future of Darlington, may that prosperity make changes for the most broken, for the most vulnerable in our society. And Lord, just to close today, we pray for our own church community. Lord, for our own hearts, our own needs, all of which are seen by you. Lord, come, we pray, intervene in our lives. Take hold of our situations. And give us, Lord God, as we give you our burdens, would you exchange those for your peace? So come, Lord God, this morning, move amongst us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In my mid-twenties, I had an accident playing football and injured my ankles. It wasn't the first time that I'd injured my ankles. It was a, a recurring event. And uh, I hobbled along to this place called Healing Rooms, which we had in the town where I was living at the time, to see if God would do something and heal my ankles. I went with little expectation, really, although being a Christian, I did understand that God can heal, but I'd never experienced for myself a healing power of God. I went upstairs and was prayed for and uh, the lady asked what I needed to, to be prayed for and I said my ankles because I've been playing football and injured them and uh, she laid her hands on my ankles and I had the most strange experience. I heard clicking and felt movement within the ligaments or whatever it is in the ankles and from hobbling in to that place, I was able to walk out and play football just a week later. The usual routine was I would have to take six weeks off whenever I injured my ankles. But that day, God healed me. A few, um, a few years before that, we'd been in a place called Hexham and we'd seen uh, God heal somebody of a withered hand. And we'd seen a knuckle grow in that hand. But I've also got a mum who has a, a chronic health condition and has had since she was just 45. And that's uh, something like over 20 years ago now. And that's the paradox that I'm faced with when I bring a message like I'm going to do this morning on the subject of Jehovah Rapha, meaning the Lord who heals. Since January and for two more weeks, we're looking at the names of God focusing on the indescribable nature of God, using Old Testament names that are given to him, that describe him. And today it's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. 
Please would you turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15 verses 22 to 27. The Bible says this, it's entitled The Waters of Marah and Elim. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went to the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Then there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them, and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, and they camped there near the water. God always blesses the public reading of his inspired and his infallible word, and God blesses the public reading of his word today. Some of us might be newer Christians, and that Bible passage that I, might have, that I read there might be new to you. So let me just give you a reminder of the context of that passage of scripture. Of the previous 11 chapters from uh, chapter three to chapter 14, we see God's people called the Israelites. They found themselves being held in captivity in a place called Egypt. God sees their misery and asks a shepherd called Moses to go and set the people free from Egypt. After a couple of moments of uncertainty, Moses says yes to the task and goes off to see Pharaoh who's in charge of the Egyptian land. The Pharaoh um, refuses to let the people of God go. Ten times uh, God brings a plague on the people and eventually Pharaoh's convinced that he should let the people go and he lets them go and, he want, and, and they leave Egypt heading off to the promised land. After a short while though Pharaoh changes his mind and decides he wants the Israelites in captivity so he chases after them. Moses in the Israelites come to a place called the Red Sea and they've got no way of getting round it. Um, they can't go through it, they can't go round it, they can't go over it, they've got no uh, no chance of survival. They're being pursued by the, um, by the Egyptians behind them and they've got the Red Sea in front of them. God then tells Moses to raise his hand and put his staff out over the sea. The waters part, the Israelites go through. Moses stretches his hand out again over the sea and the waters go back into the sea and the Egyptians are swept away. The start of chapter 15, which we've just read, sees Moses and his sister Miriam praising God with all uh, the Israelites joining in until we pick up this passage in verse 22, which we've just read. Today we're concentrating on that phrase there, Jehovah Rapha, meaning the Lord who heals, as in verse 26 that we read and I want to think about three specific areas in which the Lord heals this morning. Yes, we're going to look at physical healing as one of those, but, but not concentrate only on physical healing. The first one I want to look at the, this morning, the first way in which God heals is he heals our perspective. It's really interesting that the first time the, the, the Lord in this passage is called the Lord who heals, he doesn't, feel, he doesn't heal anyone physically but he heals the water. The first healing that the Israelites need is a healing or a right viewing of how they're seeing their situation or their mindset or a perspective needs healing. That's the first point this morning. God heals our perspective. In Romans 12 2, the Apostle Paul writes that Christians should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To renew means to completely change for better or to heal. God heals our minds. There's so much going on in this passage. I just want to pick out a few things to share. Firstly, that we see the Israelites going from a place of, of grumbling to gratitude. 
So we've just read of this great victory that the people have had going through the Red Sea, being freed from captivity and all that's been promised to them as they enter into the, on their way into the promised land. So where do we find God's people? Are they rejoicing? Are they thanking God for all he's done? Are they singing his praises? No, the morning. Now I'm sure nobody watching this, nobody would be somebody who would be a mourner or a grumbler or a complainer. But then, the Israelites, however, are a mourning people. We read in the chapter before, when faced with the Red Sea in chapter 14, verse 10, they said, Have you just brought us here to die? It would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. How quickly in our reading have they forgotten once again that God is for them and turned grumbling in against the one who's just led them through an amazing victory in crossing the Red Sea. Wouldn't you think that that victory might be a little bit fresher in their mind? Wouldn't you think that they might have a little bit more understanding? You see, their disposition as a people is not that the glass is half full or, or the glass is half empty. They don't even see the glass. That is their perspective. Instead of remembering that God has been with them through the journey, instead of remembering that God has brought them out of slavery, instead of remembering the salvation of the people as they pass through the Red Sea in a miraculous way, they mourn, they whinge, they complain that things aren't going their way right now. And we might sneer at that attitude. We sit on the other side of the New Testament equivalent of the Red Sea experience. We sit in a place where salvation has been won, where victory is assured in Jesus, yet many of us find ourselves mourning and whinging and complaining when things aren't going our way. I want to take a minute to encourage you this morning to remember all that God has done. You see, our gratitude dictates our attitude. Do you see Moses and Miriam respond to the victory of God? They sing with joy. And the people join in with their voices, but where are their hearts? Are their hearts rejoicing or is it, are they just singing? You see, there's a couple of ways in which we can sing, aren't there? We can sing with our voices or we can sing with our hearts. And there's a difference in how we sing. The Bible teaches us that we enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. If we think more on the good things that God has done rather than the things that we don't have, then perhaps we wouldn't grumble and complain so much. We so quickly forget that God is reliable, that God is dependable, that God is faithful. And then they move from a place of feelings to faith. You see, from the time of Abraham, God has promised a land for his people. A land of their own was on its way. And just at the moment of the promise being fulfilled, the Israelites are more concerned with how they feel in this moment rather than the promise of God which is to come. So what about us? What do we have our eyes fixed on? Are we fixed on the moment or are we fixed on the, 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 the eternal? Some of us might say, well, I was brought up to be feelings led, you know, my mum and dad, they're, they're how they felt was how they reacted. But the Bible teaches us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. But the Israelites seem to be on this swing of feelings. God is good because God has done some good things and he is with them. God is bad because he doesn't appear to be with them and not acting in their circumstances. God is good because he's done something good and he is with them. God is bad because he doesn't appear to be with them. That's how they feel, uh, their feelings are led, leading their, their, their faith journey. And I wonder if any of us live our lives like that. See, one of the ways in which God wants to heal our mindset is to move from a place of being dictated by our feelings to a place of being dictated by our faith. We're not supposed to be like children on a swing. God is with us, God is not with us. God is with us, God is not with us. We're supposed to be firm in our faith, regardless of what is going on around us. And the third, uh, the third place in this mini point is that from God, God's people move from a place of bitterness to blessing. You remember that this first healing is not a physical healing because nobody's even ill. 
but that a place of bitterness or a place of sickness becomes a place of springs, which is a bless, which is a metaphor for blessing at the hands of God. You see, bitterness tends to be more dramatically displayed in our dry times. I've found when I'm in a dry place spiritually, one of the most difficult things to do is not to grumble. If you're in a dry place spiritually, the easy thing to do is to say, well, I didn't get much out of that service today. That sermon was too long. The worship wasn't great. I wish they'd sung this song. Or God hasn't acted in this situation, so he mustn't be here. Or if he is there, then he's turned his ear away from me. I'm doing something wrong. But one of the greatest challenges for us as humans is that when things go as we haven't anticipated, is not to grumble and not to complain. If I find myself grumbling and complaining, I tend to find my relationship with Christ isn't all that it should be. The temptation is when we're grumbling and when we're complaining is to not go to God, but to find somebody else who can also grumble and complain with us. And I know that is the case because I sometimes do that myself. Rather than going to God, we find somebody else who we can grumble and complain with who won't put us right and we'll say, oh yes, that is the case, isn't it? I'm sure none of you do that. I think God might want to challenge some of that behaviour this morning. If we're in a dry place spiritually, then the solution isn't to mourn louder or find people to mourn with or anything else other than to find the water. To find the water of life whose name is Jesus Christ. To drink of him and to be satisfied. If we want to be in a place of blessing, we need to move from a place of bitterness. It might be we've got unforgiveness in our hearts. That's a place of bitterness. It might be we're committing habitual sin. That's a place of bitterness. God won't bless us until we leave that place. The Israelites had to move from Mara to Elim. And so do we. We need to make a conscious decision to move from a place of bitterness to a place of blessing. Fourthly, on this first point this morning, they moved from a place of slaves to sons. The final thing to say on this first point is that a major problem of the Israelites was that God brought the people out of slavery. Yet they came out of slavery with a mindset that they were still in it. God took the Israelites out of Egypt, but Egypt stayed with the Israelites. Friends, let me remind you this morning, you're not a slave of Christ, but you are a son of God. Whether you're male or female, you are a son with a capital S. Because it's about the inheritance that you claim from being a child of the living God. We're called children of the living God, precious and honoured in his sight, redeemed, loved. Yet some of us still live like the victory in Christ is uncertain. In the desert of Shur, as we read in chapter 15, verse 22, 22 in the desert of Shur, when God seemed distant, how sure are you that God is with you in the desert? In the desert of Shur, how sure are you that God is with you in the desert? Will you allow him this morning to come and to heal your perspective of who you are this morning? To give you a right mind on your circumstances, your situations, to take your place of bitterness and make it into a place of springs. God will heal our perspective if we let him. Secondly, this morning, God does heal physically. I want to talk about that for a few moments because it's important. And uh, in our churches, we sometimes we sometimes don't speak about the supernatural for fear of being seen as a little bit wacky. In my life, I talked about seeing my own ankles healed. I've talked about seeing uh, a knuckle grow. I've I've seen people healed from head to toe of eczema. I've seen my own mum suffer with this chronic health condition for over 20 years. And I've seen young family die uh, at a very young age. And that's the paradox that I'm left with when I want to talk to you this morning about being healed by God. What I'm sure of today, though, is that God heals. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, wasn't just a God who healed in the Old Testament. He wasn't just a God who healed through um, through his son Jesus. We see healing in the book of Acts. Let me share a few reasons why I believe today that God heals and encourage you to believe that too. Healing throughout the Bible 
In Genesis chapter 20, Abimelech is healed of infertility. Eutychus in Acts 20 is healed of death and everything in between. You see, God's nature is to heal. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. His nature is to heal. Some of us will know the stories from the Bible of blind Bartimaeus suddenly being able to see, of a young girl who was the daughter of Jairus, who Christ raised. He heals those with skin diseases, he heals men, he heals women, boys, girls, those in high society, those lowly. He heals creation by calming a storm. He heals nature by feeding 5,000 men with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. It doesn't matter to God if you're married or, or unmarried, if you're, if you're a man or a woman, if you're a believer, or even if you're not a believer, God is still able to heal. Jesus carried out healings of 27 individuals and others in groups. There are 14 more healings when Jesus has ascended to heaven, to the book of Acts. Acts 3, uh, there's a healing of a lame man through Peter and John, who were early disciples. In Acts 8, Philip healed in Acts 9, uh, Peter healed. In Acts 28, Paul heals a man of fever and dysentery. And the rest of the island too, it says. So if you need more convincing than, than the scripture which teaches us that, that God heals after Jesus has ascended, then we look at church history and we look at famous people like the Jeffreys brothers and Smith Wigglesworth and John Wimber. And if you don't know of those people, then look them up. And that's just in the 20th century. If you don't know who these people are, look them up and you'll see that remarkable men and women have the power of God within them to heal. Although please be under no illusion that they were not and neither is anybody who's watching this a faith healer. There's only one who heals and his name is Jesus. We can't do the healing. He can. And sometimes in his grace, he chooses to use us to um to lay hands on people and to heal. You see in Acts chapter 3 we read this, that by the faith in the name of Jesus this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. It is the name of Jesus which heals. There is power in the name of Jesus for healing. In the name of Jesus. Not the name of Buddha, not the name of Muhammad, not the name of Krishna, not the name of any other God with a small g who you care to mention. The name of Jesus. Maybe you've tried the gods of this age. Wealth, alcohol, relationships, drugs. But you find the one who heals is Jesus Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit, the dunamis, the power of God. And of course, I know this to be true in my own experience. So not only is the Bible teaching us that God heals, not only does church history teach us that God heals, but experience teaches us that God heals too. Is there anything you need physically healing from this morning? Or is there anybody who you know who needs physically healing this morning? Believe that God can do that. He is able. The reality is, however, on the flip side, that some are sick and some, are, some die. The Bible doesn't shy away from that. 2 Kings 13, 14 says, Elisha, who had been suffering from the illness, so Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he then died. 2 Timothy 4 says, Trophimus, was left in Miletus sick. So in the Bible there are people who are sick, in the Bible there are people who die. And my experience would suggest that there's not always a causal effect, for, but simply the fact the world is broken. I could go on to give you a theological argument as to why we sometimes see physical healing and sometimes we don't, but this morning, suffice, uh, time is, is suffice for me to say, the more we pray, the more healings we will see. And if we don't pray, we won't. Sometimes something that is more important to the something to state, sorry, is that it is more important to see the healer than the healing. It is more important to see Christ than to see his healing. 
We must never chase the healing more than we chase the healer. See, I believe with all that I have in God, in his mercy right now, he chooses the times to show his kingdom power. And we see a breakthrough of the kingdom in our lives. Quite often, actually, this happens to those who don't yet know Jesus. In order to point the way to him, but not exclusively so. And in a few minutes when we respond together this morning, you might want to just open your arms and say, God, I need you to touch this part of my body, that part of my body, or this person or that person. Please, Lord, bring your physical healing. I believe he's able to do that. Today has all the potential to be a breakthrough of God's kingdom moment for you. Now, healing could be a whole sermon. So I don't want to, uh, you know, the, the physical healing could be a whole sermon. And I know I've just spent five or so minutes on that topic this morning. Um, at some point, we will talk a little bit more about physical healing when we're all back together, possibly in our building, um, in our buildings. But the third way in which God heals, which I want to think about briefly this morning, is he heals permanently. So he heals our perspective, he heals physically and he heals permanently. What do I mean by that? Well, what, the only thing that is permanent is the kingdom of God and eternity. So he heals us to bring us wholeness. You see, we're all physically, we're not all physically sick, but we are all spiritually sick. Every person watching this, every person, whether you're a believer or a not, not yet believer, every person needs God's spiritual healing. But not every person needs God's physical healing. You see, a physical healing will last for, for while we're on this earth. But a spiritual healing is permanent. Being healed in our spirits brings us to a place of going to be with Christ in heaven. What do I mean by spiritual healing? In short, salvation. If you've ever said a wrong word, ever thought a wrong thought, if you've ever done a wrong action, you need this spiritual healing, permanent spiritual healing. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be celebrating Easter when we remember that Christ died for our sin but rose again gloriously to bring new life. The New Testament describes that healing as becoming a Christian. From passing from death into life, resurrection, from being spiritually sick to spiritually well and spiritual wellness that lasts eternally. He makes us alive through his resurrection power, being made whole spiritually. Friends, one of the most amazing things that I can share with you today is that for the Christian, the power of death has no power. It's like a wasp with its sting withdrawn. That's how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, when he writes, where or death is your victory? Where or death is your sting? You see, the Christian is assured of life following death because Jesus took the punishment for our sin. Not only do we have, I love this saying, pie in the sky when we die, but steak on the plate while we wait. Jesus came that we might have life and have it in its fullness now. Many other faiths would say, you've got to climb a ladder to attain salvation. You've got to do this, do that, do the other. But Christ says, I came down the ladder to the earth. And all you have to do is to be in Christ. One day, friends, one marvellous day when the earth is no more, we'll be in a new place where the Bible calls a heaven and an earth. A new heaven, a new earth. Where there's no more sickness, no mourning, no crying, no death. You see, at that place, physical healing will no longer be required. Perspective healing will no longer be required. And permanent healing will have taken place. We read in our passage today that God uses a piece of wood to heal the water and bring life to the Israelites. Friends, listen, 2,000 years ago, God used another piece of wood. They call it the cross to bring healing to our lives. To turn our place of bitterness into a place of blessing. And it's up to us whether we choose to accept that ultimate healing or not. 
I want to remind us that we all need healing. We're all damaged pots. Do you and I this morning want to reach the potential that we have in our lives? The only way we can do that is to be in Christ. Let him bring shalom, which is wholeness. Do you long for peace? Christ can bring that. Whether it's our perspective, whether it's our physical being, or whether this morning we need a, a permanent healing, would you allow God to draw close to you? You see, too often in my experience, in churches, we limit God by our own experience. If we haven't experienced a healing, we say, well, God's not able to do that. But friends, he is. And this morning, I believe God wants to move in your homes. And he wants to bring to you the thing that you need. One woman in the Bible had waited 12 years for her healing. And she had to push through the crowds when everybody was saying, shh, shh, Jesus doesn't need you. Jesus doesn't want you. Yet she reached out and touched the hem of his garment and she was healed. Would you this morning reach out to him and ask him, Lord God, bring healing today. Let me pray. Lord, would you bring healing? Come, Lord Jesus. Touch our bodies, we pray. Touch our minds, we pray. Bring salvation. Maybe you're watching this and you don't yet know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Maybe you saw the topic was healing and you were interested. If that's you this morning, then open your heart to Christ and then let us know you've opened your heart to him. Lord, move, we pray. As we sing and respond to you, move, we pray. In Jesus' name. So now we move into a time of response toward the Lord. And we open our hearts afresh to him. And we ask him to move in power, in healing power, as we respond to him. Do you need him to heal your perspective this morning? Do you need him to heal you physically this morning? Do you need him to heal you permanently this morning? Why don't you, if you're able, just open your arms as if you're receiving a gift and allow God to speak to you, to minister to you and perhaps to do, even in your homes this morning, heal. He is able. You hold my every moment You come my raging sea You walk with me through fire And heal all my disease I trust I 
believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Do I believe that this morning? Is he all, all that you need? we worship him why don't you tell him what you need from him this morning and allow him to come and to, to heal and to speak and to move he is able yes you are you hold my every moment you come the raging sea you walk with me and heal all my disease I trust in you yes I do Lord I trust in you I believe you're my healer I believe power of your spirit would you move in healing power this morning the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us please move by your spirit we pray continue to do so throughout the rest of our morning and into our afternoon in Jesus name Amen, Amen. let's conclude by saying the words of the grace together may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.